Hi, my name is Jared Michael. I am a demo artist working for Inchware Australia. And in this video, we're going to take a look at the Foundry's Mari, a comprehensive high-end texturing solution. This presentation is intended for those new to Mari. However, we'll also touch on some of the latest features in Mari 3, such as the new MGO Maya to Mari bridge. We're going to start by introducing Mari before talking about case study and then moving on to its key features and finally, we will jump into the software and I'll show you the tools and demonstrate some of the highlights. Mari is the highest end 3D painting tool for creating textures. It is the most powerful and flexible and it is a complete single application texturing solution for all kinds of production. Let's take a look at a case study of Mari being used in production, specifically Weta's use of Mari on Avatar. There were 54 artists painting 2.5 million textures and assets were seen from all different types of distances, very, very close and also far away. A typical character on Avatar had between 150 to 170 Udom patches, each with 30 or more channels, for example, albedo, specular, subsurface, displacement, etc. They also had around 500,000 polygons at subdivision level one. The shuttle alone was 30 gigs per channel of data for the fine displacement detail. In this case, it was 500 4K texture maps. Overall, assets of over 20 million polygons were painted. Mari being able to keep up with these extreme demands demonstrates its ability to facilitate the needs of high-end production. Let's now move on and take a look at some of the key features of Mari that set it apart from its competition. Firstly, their painting capabilities. Mari uses a unique paint buffer workflow where you are painting onto a piece of digital glass that is projected onto the canvas. This allows artists to reuse paint strokes and decide when to bake this projection down onto UVs. Artists can work in both 3D space and UV space at the same time as seen on the image on the right offering the utmost in flexibility. Mari comes with an extensive range of brush customization and Photoshop brushes can be imported. As well as this, a range of unique tools are the perfect match for 3D texturing, such as the ability to slurp, which is like Photoshop's liquify, or lattice distort textures into place. Mari offers the most powerful and customizable layer system and offers features such as the ability to create PBR accurate base layers, procedural layers such as fractals, tileable textures and ambient occlusion, as well as adjustment stacks that can be used to group multiple adjustments into one contained place, keeping the main layer view clean. Masks can be stacked in a similar way and both adjustment and mask stacks can have further stacks on stacks on stacks, etc. as required. To even further extend the system, layers, masks and adjustments can be shared between channels, which opens up the opportunity to do things like painting an erosion mask of metal to reveal underlying rust, and have this flow through to the albedo, roughness, spec, all at the same time, whilst interactively seeing this occur in the viewport. In terms of performance, Mari supports hundreds of high resolution texture UDMs per model, many channels, even with a high poly count or subdivision level. Optimization such as layer sharing and the ability to cache layers not currently being worked on means that artists can maintain a high level of interactivity and viewport performance. There are also many included utility functions such as the paint buffer workflow previously mentioned, the ability to transfer textures onto other models with differing UV sets even if they are in a physically different location this is a new feature to Mari and means if the UVs or topology change, no work is lost. Mari makes use of a non-destructive adjustment system that can be changed at a later point in time, allowing for inevitable feedback changes after review. The snapshot system saves points in time that can be restored and is useful for saving versions of LookDev or states of approval. A new node graph system in Mari 3 introduces a nuke-like way of building networks that can be built into gizmo-like structures and allows for reuse and sharing on other assets. Diagnostic turntables can be rendered out directly from Mari for review purposes. And further to all of this utility, the new Moto renderer and baking system in Mari 3 allows invaluable maps such as a high quality ambient occlusion and curvature maps to be rendered out to aid masking requirements. 
Mari was built for production, and as such has many production relevant features, such as the ability to preview your textures in context, with Mari 3's new OpenGL representations of specific rendering engine shaders, including Arnold, V-Ray, Redshift, and Unreal. HDRI lighting allows textures to be lit in the specific environment they will be rendered in, or easily swapped between multiple environments to check the look in different contexts. Animation caches can be imported which allows textures to be tested under deformation. Mari has a range of interoperability, such as the Nuke Mari Bridge, aiding plate cleanup, projections, matte painting, etc. And the new Mari Maya Bridge, labelled MGO, allows textures, shader setups, HDRI lighting to be sent across to aid final setup or enable further testing in the final rendering engine. This bridge will even set up displacement and is ready to render after transferring. A Photoshop link is supported to enable you to send a projection across, leverage Photoshop's tools, and then project this back onto the model. And industry standard formats such as Alembic are also supported. I'm now going to jump into Mari and show you some of the features in action. I'll start with an overview of the interface before moving on to look at the shader, channel, layer setup. We'll then set up some base layers and procedurals, explore painting and masking techniques in conjunction with the Moto renderer. Finally, we'll use the new MGO system to transfer our work from Mari to Maya for final testing. Okay, jumping into Mari now, let's take a look at the interface. We have our file menus up the top as normal. We have the ability to bring up all of our different tabs by right clicking on some empty space in the UI and the orange ones are currently turned on. This is all customizable, but currently on the right hand side I have my layer stack, which is albedo. We have blending layers, we can rename, we can create layers, masks, adjustment layers, uh, procedurals, graph layers, we can duplicate, remove, etc. On the left hand side we have our shaders, I'm using Arnold at the moment and I've got an AI standard, but there are also Unreal shaders there, V-Ray, Redshift, etc. as well as Ola, Fong, Blin shaders. So in this case, uh, with this AI standard I already have my albedo layer that I've created and I've mapped that into the diffuse color slot just as normal. And then our channels itself, we have an albedo layer, which is uh, where I'm holding all of the layers themselves. If you take a look at the projection menu here, we have control over how paint is pushed onto the UVs after we paint it onto the canvas. Bottom left, I've got that MGO palette, which is how we're going to transfer everything from Mari into Maya later on. On the top here, we've got our tool controls. So depending on which tool we have created, we'll have different options there. Visibility controls, we have different shading modes, shortcuts F1 and F3, and then all of our individual tools. So our selection tools, ability to pan our, our canvas around, our, our um, projection canvas. Then we can, we've got our vector painting tools, blurring, warping, slurping, pinning, painting, vector, eraser, paint through canvas, gradient, clone stamp, toe brush our color picker and then next up we have our different uh, color colors that we can choose and we can swap those with X and default them to black and white with D. If I tap I I can get a shortcut uh, way of just looking at all the different objects, shaders, channels and layers so we can look at a particular layer or a specific paint target which is very useful for diagnosing an issue. I can also uh, tap L to get my image manager up and uh, I can get K there as well to bring up custom rushes. Home is going to go ahead and hide our side menus here and all of these are customizable. So I can go view and save my layout or load a layout. This is completely uh, up to you. And it can obviously be torn off, moved around onto other monitors as well. Okay, we're going to start off by creating a number of kind of base layers for us to start with. And uh, the way this is gonna work, we have to have our layer channels and uh, shader setup. So basically the re relationship is that we have normal layers as you're used to in Photoshop and these get piped into a channel. So for example, albedo. albedo, albedo might have several layers inside of that. And then that albedo channel is then in turn piped into the appropriate slot on our shader. So it's layer, channel, shader. I'm just gonna bring up the selection sets and you can see here I have a bunch of different ones and these are ones that I have created inside mine. I can click them to view what those are. This is something to help me texture or they're basically a way of creating a kind of matte IDs or selection sets or selection masks, however you wanna consider those. 
Looking at our tabs at the top, we have the ability to view our different projects. We can view our UV space there, and we can also look at our ortho and UV space so we can texture in 3D and 2D space at the same time. And we can also view in perspective with a sort of camera uh, distortion involved there as well. Right now I'm gonna stick with the perspective mode and we're gonna start by putting some base layers down for this uh, character. This character I modeled in Maya and Modo and it is uh, basically a number of UDMs compressed down to one just for demo purposes. And we're gonna start with uh, a number of bases. Firstly, Chrome, I've created this procedural material. This is new to Mari 3. And I'm basically saying I've selected it as Chrome and the base color is gonna be specifically, I'm choosing it to be Albedo. This is a library sort of system and they are physically accurate values. This is something that's just really useful and it's gonna work across all renderers to give us a really good starting point. Okay, I'm going to create another material here. This one can be an aluminium and I'm gonna say this is also Albedo by default, and I can rename that. Uh, by default, is called Base Color Catalogs. But we're gonna go ahead and uh, just rename that to our aluminium. In this case, I'm adding a selection set mask to it. So only areas that I tell it in the selection group, it's only going to be applied to that area. Now in this case, they're both black base materials, but they are uh, there are differences between the roughness and the specular values that we'll start to see later on. that will define the look, uh, look dev further. I'm now going to create another paint layer. This is going to be for our paint. Uh, so again, this is going to be uh, by default going across everything. This is this is now just a procedural color rather than part of the library. So you can use whatever you like. There's just uh, a few different ways about you can go go ahead about creating your bases. You could just paint straight to the canvas and flood it that way, or onto UV space, uh, or use one of these procedural layers. And these procedural layers is just a very good flexible system of being able to make changes later on with very little effort. So I've named that a paint layer. And we already have this uh, channel for albedo. So I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate this setup and then we'll see what this looks like once we have a specular and a roughness layer. Okay, so I'm just plugging these in now. So we've got our spec and we've got our roughness and pressing F3 to view this in shaded mode, we can see this isn't quite looking uh, how we'd imagine. And this is because we've put you know black into our specular and black into our roughness. So it's not very rough, so it is actually quite shiny but there's no specular value, which is why it's just looking kind of uh, like a, almost like a matte plastic uh, at this point. We wanted to, to reflect the environment around there. So just adjusting those one by one, I'm gonna to go to uh, these base layers and change from albedo, change it to the appropriate uh, one we're working on. So for example, uh, we can change our spec to reflectance and our roughness to, uh, that, to roughness in there as well. Then just manually changing the paint value uh, for our spec. And this is something we need to re refine with uh, the roughness of the paint. So let's just jump to our roughness and we'll do the same thing. Jumping between F1 to see what this channel looks like flat and then F3 to see the contribution with the shading. Now just making some changes to the roughness value to really fine tune you know, kind of what we want this to be how shiny uh, that paint should be as a starting point. Again, just, this is all gonna have a lot of wear and tear on top, so it's okay to be a little bit shinier than we're intending right now. And now coming back to our spec and making some, some further modifications to that paint. So it gives you an idea of how quickly you can put down some base layers using a combination of selection groups or other masks, or even just selecting. There are a bunch of different selection modes in Mari you can use to aid this process, but I find the selection groups is quite useful. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump uh, straight into this next scene that has a number of different materials set up. And these are uh, kind of, uh, we've got aluminium, I've got a darker metal, a brush metal, rubber, rust, etc. Now what I can do is I've just used this procedural layer to turn on this camouflage. And you can find this under procedural pattern tiled. I've just loaded in a tile, tiled image from the image manager, tapping L to bring that one up, dragging it across and uh, we can just choose what image we want in there, or we can just browse manually for a texture as well. We can also change the repeating of that texture, the U repeat and the V repeat. And these are excellent for blocking out a particular base layer if you want some sort of underlying pattern, or later on we're gonna use this kind of same kind of idea to uh, bring in different grunge as a starting point, which you can then paint on and off depending on uh, where we need this.
Okay, now looking at our light section, we have the ability to change the environment light in our scene. Uh, you might have a specific one that you know this uh, character is going to be placed into, so you can always use that by browsing for a custom HDRI, or it, it's also equally useful to check this character under multiple lighting conditions as well to make sure that's uh, that's working in several contexts. You have controls here to animate the HDRI moving, so we have an animated light over the surface, which is definitely very useful, as well as the ability to blur out the background if we just want to get the rough sense of that, or we can hide it altogether. So right now we're going to go ahead and just show you some of the manual uh, kind of painting tools in here. And using the projection tab here, we can control whether we're baking manually. That is when we draw on the surface, whether it's immediately going to be baked down or whether it's going to be stored on the canvas. So right now I'm putting some paint strokes down. But you notice that as I move the camera around, it's not actually on the, the surface yet. It's on this kind of uh, buffer or kind of imagine as a piece of digital glass that we're painting onto. It's only on a tap B on the bottom right there. We see that's actually going to bake down onto the UVs itself. This is useful for a number of things. Firstly, a number of operations are relying on this, but also after we bake once, we don't have to clear our buffer. We can move to a different point and then bake again. So this could be something like edgeware or a particular detail. We spend a while getting on the glass pane buffer and then reusing that over different areas. So it's just kind of speeding up your workflow quite a bit by doing this. Okay, so now looking at the uh, projection through an image. So you can see we can use our image manager here to drag any image we like onto the canvas and uh, then paint that through depending on uh, you know, where we want that to be. So I'm going to use this decal and I'm going to place this on uh, the top right here of this robot. So again, this isn't actually on there until we paint it. So I've got to use a paintbrush P and start brushing this onto our paint buffer. And again, this still isn't on our model. We can move our camera around and it's not baked just yet. I'm going to use this lattice tool and just drag select and use the tool properties and just up the resolution of this. And that allows us to deform this paint kind of manually with this grid, very much like a, a distort uh, or similar in Photoshop, but it has the much better ability that we can uh, subdivide that grid. And we can also use the slurp tool, as you see there, just to kind of make smaller brush-like modifications and warps similar to the liquify tool. So I've hit B to bake that and then I cleared the paint buffer and now I've got our decal there. All very low resolution for this demo but you can see what we're working with. All right so now we're just jumping uh, back to our original uh, yellow paint and we're going to create a new procedural layer here. The idea being we want to put some grunge onto the model and then we can uh, basically um, multiply that down and just have some overall grunge as a starting point. Okay, so now we're basically going to use a procedural layer, which I've just dragged the image from the image manager onto this procedural and just tiling it a little bit more. And this is going to be the base for our grunge texture. So we can create an adjustment stack for this, which is just going to allow us to have a number of different uh, adjustments like levels, grade, hue, saturation, all those sorts of things which we'd normally have a layer for in Photoshop for example, we can have contained in this stack of layers. just keeps our, our layer menu here quite neat. I've just put this uh, tiled uh, onto uh, blending mode and created a mask for that because right now it's going over everything and by clicking on that mask which is now active we can paint on that because by default I just created a mask that was already filled with white so anything that I paint here it's going to start removing uh, some of that surface. Okay so we're just using a bunch of different brushes showing you here that we have a number of brushes that come with uh, Mari by default and you can use uh, whatever brush you like here the controls for these, we can change the opacity, we can change the radius quite easily. Uh, there's just a number of different types we can use to start eroding some of, uh, some of the uh, over-the-top kind of runs that we've got going on at the moment. Okay, so right now this is looking a little bit odd because it's only being applied to the albedo. We'd expect this dirt to be causing the paint and the, and the metal to be rougher on those areas. And we also expect the same thing to be happening on our specular. So you could share this layer and then make individual unique adjustments in the adjustment stack, or you could just copy the layer itself into the other channels. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to 
uh, reveal some of the rust which is hiding underneath that rust layer. So what I'm doing now is I'm brushing on a mask and what you're actually seeing is the underlying layer itself being revealed. So I'm just going a little bit over the top here, but you can very quickly see what's happening. Not only am I painting on the albedo, we're actually seeing the changes in the normal map and the reflectance and the spec all coming through at the same time. Okay, so again, a bit over the top, but we can just tap D and uh, X to jump between our color palettes and we can just remove some of that if it's a bit over the top and go back and forth as needed. So this is a really, really useful way of being able to visualize what you're doing and how it's gonna, uh, how it's going to correlate between your other channels, not just your albedo. The traditional way of doing this would be in to duplicate them after you've done one. So moving on to look at the Moto renderer now, we go to the Bake tab here. We're going to uh, allow this to generate us some uh, channels that'll help us in masking and creating some edge wear uh, on metal. We'd expect there to be some extra kind of wear happening on our edges. So if I just uh, change the uh, just zoom in here a little bit, we'll be able to get a closer look of you know, what this uh, AO is going to look like. And we can change the settings, our occlusion distance specifically, to a higher number, to something like uh, 10 or 1000, and that's gonna get, get a better result for us. So if I just turn this curvature uh, layer on, which I've uh, created before, you can kind of see what effect it's having. Okay, jumping ahead now to a completed version or a more in progress version of this texture. We have all of those procedures that we were creating sort of a bit more polished to them and then we've duplicated them across all of the channels. So not only are they in the albedo, we've got them in the specular, the roughness and our bump or our normal uh, or displacement. And that is now helping us to get a better feel of what that's gonna look like. I've also used that edge wear from the curvature map and propagated that across the channels, which is giving us this kind of feel of metal uh, across here uh, where edge would be. You definitely create custom masks and go ahead and further refine that so it's not quite a, a uniform uh, kind of mask, but as a starting point, it's a really good place to be in. Now, because we've used procedurals, we're in a really good uh, position to further make changes. So you might have a review and you need to swap something out, you can easily do that. So for example, if we told, we actually don't want it to be this shade of uh, yellow anymore, it won't be uh, maybe like a really dark, kind of uh, military uh, green or something along those lines, we can easily make changes to that without any problem at all. Uh, as well as that, we could just use, if we're using tileable textures, we could easily pump that in there and then we could swap out our uh, procedures with any sort of other uh, image that we've got in our image manager. And again, all of our previous work is still being maintained. We've just got this underneath our current layer stack. So what we're going to do now is take a look at the MGO system and you can find that underneath the Python menu under examples there is this MGO section and that's going to allow us to open up the palette or as well as that you might be worthwhile to have a look at the manual. Uh, so right now I've already opened the palette and we can see it's going to wherever we ask it to go and we can either choose to bake out our channels themselves, the shader and if we want we can also export the model. In this case, I'm going to export the, all the models. And I'm choosing my file type for 32-bit. And uh, then I can simply pass this off. Or I can export a script uh, which contains this information. So if we have a look, if we have a look at the manual, we can kind of see what's involved with setting this up. It's quite simple. Basically, what you need to do is jump to your C drive program files, Mari and then media scripts Maya. Inside that you'll find there's two folders. There's a scripts and an icons folder. You need to jump to your Maya documents folder. So C drive users documents Maya 2016, jump inside your prefs folder and then paste both of the folders that you've got from here into that location. And there's instructions for how to do that on Mac and Linux here as well. That's pretty much all you need to do. You need to jump into Maya then copy this line of code and paste that and create a button on the shelf for you. And once you've done that, you'll have uh, an icon here. You've got to set up a custom icon and we have this particular toolbox. Okay, so let's now take a look at the new MGO system, which is the uh, system in Mari that allows you to take your work, including your model, your shader setup, 
your textures baked down and even your HDRI lighting information and transfer across this to Maya for either a final setup or even just testing or for further look dev. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring up this MGO palette and you can do that underneath the Python examples MGO and then open up this palette or shift and four and you can also open the PDF manual here. Opening that manual up we've got our installation instructions. I'm going to go through this now. So for a Windows install all you want to do is jump to your Program Files, Mari 3.1 or whatever version you're on, Bundle, Media, Scripts, Maya, and you'll find there's two folders here, your icon and your scripts. You then want to navigate to your documents, Maya 2016 or relevant version, Preferences, and then paste these two folders over the top of the icons and scripts folders here. Then inside Maya, we want to take this particular line of code and copy that, and then we can paste that into our box here. Uh, we're not going to be using ML, we're going to be using Python. So if you were to execute that, you'd paste it and run it. In this case, we're going to just drag that across uh, to our menu. So just middle mouse and just drag that up to this place and then call that a Python executable script. And then all I've done then is just go to the uh, icon for that and just replace it with the MGO shelf icon. So now we've done that, we can jump back to Mari uh, and we can actually use this to transfer our texture across. And this is what the MGO window looks like inside of Maya. And it's going to allow us to just send the correct texture across. So if I jump back here in my MGO palette, I've just chosen the location for that. And I'm choosing whether I am including my textures, my shader and the model, as well as uh, what particular scenes I'm uh, can be exporting and what type of file format before we can click the MGO button. And what it's going to do, it's going to bake down all the textures for all our channels. It's going to create a setup for us in Maya. So I'm just going to hit OK on that and let that do its thing. OK, so that's baked out. So the next thing we need to do is to send across our camera and also the environment light. So I'm just changing it to ENV and, and then sending that across. And then we've also sent that. Okay, now we're in Maya. We've transferred that across and basically you can see we've got our Mari camera that's been set up. It's exactly the same as what we had inside here. And it have also set up the shader. Now what will often happen is if we select that object, we'll see it hasn't actually applied the material. It's, it still, still has uh, the Lambert 1 applied. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to select everything and then just apply the material. So it has created the material, it has brought it across, just hasn't actually applied it. So this is a bug in the current version and it is being remedied. Now with the release of Mari 3.1, there was an early version of MGO. If you would like to uh, get the latest version, you can jump on to the Foundry uh, forum website and then just go into the MGO system and there's a link there of where you can download that. So just search for Mari MGO Foundry and you'll get to this new uh, MGO tool, my new features. And this is the link down here it actually has the latest uh, version of where you can get um, the, the most up-to-date version, which is the most bug fixes from this link. Okay, and then throwing off a render, we can see we've got the environment there, we've got our geometry in, and we've got that matching the uh, lights and the materials in our scene. So it's set up our albedo for you, the roughness, my normal map, uh, spec etc and just be aware that if you do have an issue where you know some of your maps aren't coming through it's because of that bug in the initial version of MGO that comes with Mari 3.1 so jump onto the Foundry MGO forum and you'll be able to download the latest version from there that will fix up those issues. So a very handy tool it's definitely something that accelerates your ability to either test or do your final setup of uh, you know submitting to uh, render you can actually use this in the other way of going from Maya to Mari so if you might have some geometry here that you want to send across you can also do that as well and there's a bunch of different options for uh, bringing across and sending things back and forth naming and uh, that sort of thing so a very useful system I hope you check that out and uh, in general Mari 3 has got some major advancements to it that are, uh, are definitely a nice step up from 2.6 and that's it for the demo. 
I hope you've gotten something out of this introduction to Mari. It really is the most powerful and flexible texturing solution out there, and it perfectly meets the unique needs of high-end production. Mari Non-Commercial is available for testing and learning purposes, and if you'd like to evaluate the full version of the software, contact your Foundry reseller. In the Australian New Zealand region, this is Intraware, contact details available at intraware.com.au.